my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello, Beyond Your Wildest Genes Tribe. This is Dr. Noah. We wanted to make you aware of our carefully selected product of the month and book of the month for 2017. Keep in mind all the links and discount codes for the book and products will be listed in the show notes in iTunes and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. Our book of the month is The Hidden School, Return of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. This book is the long-awaited conclusion to the international best-selling Peaceful Warrior Saga. Our product of the month is Dr. Cowan's Garden, nutritionally powerful and playful vegetable powders. These powders are a clear and direct way to nutritional diversity. Check out my podcast with Dr. Cowan this month for all the details. Get 20% off your first order using the code BYWG. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I'm your co-host. Today our guest is Dr. Tom Cowan. Dr. Cowan, you've been one of my biggest virtual mentors in shaping how I view health and healing, so I'm super excited to have you on today. Thank you for being being available. Oh, that's nice of you to say. Thank you for having me. So, you know, before we dive deep, let me do your bio and then we'll get started. Uh, Dr. Thomas Cowan has studied and written about many subjects in medicine, including nutrition, anthroposophical medicine, and herbal medicine. He's the author of Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, How and Why to Eat More Vegetables, The Fourfold Path to Healing, and co-author with Sally Fallon of the Nourishing Traditions book of Baby and Child Care. Dr. Cowan has served as Vice President of the Physicians Association for Anthroposophic Medicine and is a founding board member of the Western A. Price Foundation. He has lectured throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, I have to, before we start, because I've never heard the term before except for some of your more recent interviews, anthroposophic medicine, is there a quick definition for that? Uh, it's the... Uh... Well, anthroposophy means wisdom of man, which is kind of a lofty title. Um, it's basically the uh, guy named Rudolf Steiner. Sure, okay. So he, he had a philosophy, which was called anthroposophy, and then he wanted to apply it to various practical areas of life. So essentially he started anthroposophical schooling, which is called Waldorf schools, Oh, okay. All right. All right. He started anthroposophical gardening, which or farming, which is called biodynamics. And then he started anthroposophical medicine, which is called <laughs> anthroposophical medicine. So they should have a new a different title for that. But they don't. You know, I'm so I'm so familiar with biodynamic farming and the Wardell School and Rudolf Steiner, but just not that term. So thanks for clarifying that for me yeah. and for our audience. I appreciate it. So, yeah, that's, so that's just the generic term for the philosophy that comes out of his work. Okay, thank you. So today I, I we have we could talk on a multitude of topics. But today we're here to talk about your new company called Dr. Cowan's Garden. Um, but before I even start, I want to just mention that in our show notes, in our in our weekly email, there'll be links to all these products. Um, Dr. Cowan has set up, was generous and gracious enough for our audience, created a 20% off first purchase code, which is BYWG. But all of that stuff will be in all the show notes, so please They'll be, it'll be easy to find this stuff. But before we dive deep on, on Dr. Cowan's garden, Dr. Cowan, can you give our audience a little bit of background about yourself and your journey just to kind of set the stage? Um, you know, I grew up in, uh, I'd say, a fairly usual way. Mostly was what I guess people would call a jock, <laughs> uh, very intense basketball player and golfer, mostly. Uh, then I went to college, uh, didn't like it because they didn't, it just, I, I just didn't like it. But I got out of there as quick as I could, joined the Peace Corps and went to Southern Africa where I learned about um, the work of Rudolf Steiner and Weston Price while living in a mud hut in Swaziland, which 
I think that's the only person probably alive who can say that. <laughs> I had not much else to do, so I started learning about gardening and food and, you know, esoteric thought and what medicine really could be. So that led me to decide I could, in fact, go to medical school. And from the beginning, I was not interested so much in being a conventional doctor. So I've been doing food medicine and and anthroposophical medicine and herbal stuff and more more so just trying to figure out what's real and what isn't real it's harder than you think or maybe not but um, most of what we tend to believe is true in just about any realm there is it turns out to be not true and that's particularly the case in science and medicine or as I sometimes say, the trouble with science is it's not very scientific. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. It seems as we get more technologically sound, the confusion just grows deeper and deeper. Yeah, something like that. So <laughs> it's been whatever. I Just my interest, I don't know that it's a quest, but just interest to figure out you know, I can name so many examples, but, you know, the one that comes to mind is one of the hallmarks, the, the crown jewels of, of, of modern biological theory and thought is the primacy of the sodium-potassium pump in regulating the fluid balance in a cell. There's been Nobel Prizes awarded for it. It's really the crowning jewel of, crown jewel of, of cell, understanding cell biology. Everybody accepts it. There's drugs based on affecting the sodium potassium pump. And it turns out it's basically nonsense. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought? And, and it's not like I set out to figure out that this thing that I learned in high school biology and in medical school is nonsense. It just kind of, you know, I just kept following the thread of, of understanding until it became clear that it's just can't be. I mean, and there's so many examples of that. I don't know if we want to go into that. Well, that. well I just would like to say one, I mean, one of the first interviews I think I heard you on probably, I, I could be way off, probably was underground wellness with Sean Croxton. And you were talking about the heart, how the heart, really pumps and works and, and I, like I said I could be way off base but that really kind of turned me on to s just thinking about things differently and, and really finding out what what's what's how do things really work <laughs> right well the heart doesn't pump <laughs> so. that, that's yeah ex exactly so if anybody's interested go back into the archives of underground wellness and and, and listen to Dr. Cowan's interview because it's it's real it was a fast it was one of my favorite interviews of all time for sure yeah. Well, that's another one. The heart is not a pump and there's a lot of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, it isn't a lot of these I was told about or learned about in in anthroposophical medicine, but for, frankly, not all of them, and not even most of them. It's just, you know, it's just my destiny, I guess. P you know, people tell me things like that <laughs> and I say, well, that can't be. But then I look into it and it turns out it can be. I, I hear you. I agree. So let's 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 get into Dr. Cowan's garden today. Uh, where did this whole idea come about? Why did you decide to start this business? Uh, where its origins? Where do you see it going? Tell us a little bit about it. I mean, so I I've been interested in food. You know, some people would call me a foodie, which you know, that's true because I spend. Even to this day, I make my own bread and make my own bone broth and make my own sauerkraut and, you know, make my own herbal extracts. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in the kitchen, food processing, etc. So just suffice to say, I'm very interested in food and also in, in medicine. And one of the things I learned, and, and this is, I think, one of the central questions that anybody needs to ask themselves about health is, is are modern Americans in the best health of anybody who's ever lived? 
Not and, even close. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, well, you say that, and 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 I agree with that. But you know, the interesting thing is, modern doctors would vehemently disagree with you. They say we're the healthiest people have ever been. Uh, that's one of the hallmarks of medical education. That because of modern medicine, people live longer on a healthier and less disease than anybody who's ever lived. And I think that's completely wrong. So, and that's basically what Weston Price found was that there are lots of people out there who live long, healthy, disease-free lives much better in a way that than modern humans, you know, Western Americans, it's not even close as far as their disease incidence and their D disability and, and, you know, cancer rates, autoimmune, you name it, we have it, they didn't have it. So it, because of that, then I tried to study, well, what did they do? Because I don't think it's genetic. There may be a some component of that, but that's not the answer. It's really how they lived. And then I, you know, I lived in, in a traditional African culture for a while and got a firsthand view of it and then have studied it pretty extensively for almost 40 years. And one of the things I figured out, and I, of course, I didn't figure this out myself, really, but is that the number of plants and animals that traditional people eat is far more than modern Americans. So, for instance, the native Californians ate approximately 110 different plants per, per year, there's a native, there's a group in in Africa, sort of a hunter gatherer group, where they eat between three and four hundred different plants and animals per year, sometimes up to forty to fifty per day. Wow. And modern Americans eat between twenty and forty per year, and about six per day. And that's like tomatoes, because ketchup, and French fries. That's potatoes, corn, wheat beef and iceberg lettuce. That's about it. Right. Um, so that to me was, you know, there's a lot of evidence on that, you know, that produces health from a number of st different standpoints, phytonutrients, um, diversity creates diverse microbiome, a, a whole lot of different reasons why eating diversity in the diet is a good thing for you. It's like you get the, the whole pharmacy of nature instead of just a few things, and then you need the pharmacy from the pharmaceutical companies. And the other thing I, I, I quickly learned was that a lot of these plants were either wild plants, which tend to have more concentrated nutrients, or perennial plants, which means plants that live more than one year. You know, so kale and tomatoes and Eggplant, those are annual plants. And I don't, it's not that I have anything against eating annual plants because I don't, and I eat them, you know, basically every day. But there was always at least, you know, a certain percentage, sometimes up to half or more, were perennial and wild vegetables. And so, being the foodie that I am, I decided to set out to get wild and perennial vegetables in my diet and tried to do that for, you know, 20 some years. And it was pretty difficult because you can't go to the farmer's market. They don't sell them in stores. There was really no source of perennial and wild vegetables, which is ironic for people who are eating what they say is a paleo or a traditional or ancestral diet. They never eat any of the vegetables that were eaten by paleo or traditional or ancestral people. So that's a little weird. Um, so, you know, that led me to you know, start gardening more and growing tree collards and ashitaba and janura. These are perennial vegetables. And so I got to the point where I could do it, but basically none of my patients could do it, which, I mean, fair enough, but that didn't seem right to me. So uh, the next step was we had this garden to grow things. I went to a restaurant and learned how to make very flavorful uh, powders out of fresh vegetables. We learned about mirin jars to preserve them. And I presented to my children and my wife, you know, hey, we could 
we could grow these perennial and source wild vegetables, make them into powders and be the people who are, you know, revolutionizing the, the vegetable component of the American diet. And that's basically how we got started. Yes. So you basically led into base, essentially the next several questions uh, that I had. So I, I'll, I'll ask questions that you kind of answered already, but I want you to just flesh them out a little bit because you did a wonderful job there. <clears throat> now, these these powders, they're, they're not necessarily used to be in place of veggies, but as a way to get more nutrients into what you're eating on a daily basis. Is that a fair statement? Right. So, for instance, you know, I, um, I, I typically... I, I like intermittent fasting, so I'll, let's say I'll eat. I'll stop eating at six o'clock the night before, so no more food after that, and then around ten to noon the next morning. So that's like after a sixteen to eighteen hour fast. I'll I'll make soup. And so we've already made the bone broth that's sitting in the fridge, and then I'll saute four, five, six different vegetables that whatever came out of the garden like leeks and onions and kale and carrots and beets and, you know, bok choy, whatever. So the usual sort of thing. And then we'll put, you put uh, bone broth on top of it. And then, and then because I don't have burdock every day and I don't have uh, tree collards every day and I don't have ashitaba, those are sitting on my counter as powders and I put like a quarter to a half a teaspoon of each in my soup. And now instead of having just annual vegetables, maybe four or five, which is probably better than some people, uh, I have, you know, 12 or eight or 10 different vegetables that are not only add flavor and, you know, spiciness. You can put pepper powder or charred eggplant powder. It, so it adds flavor, spiciness, but it, I've now increase the diversity and the phytonutrient content of my soup dramatically. And it's no more difficult than opening a box of Kellogg's cornflakes, which I haven't done in probably 50 years. I understand. So, you know, let me, let me say it like this. So I tell people, you know, burdock is great. It helps detoxify. It helps your skin. It helps your liver. There's even a report uh, possibly that it helps get rid of like agricultural chemicals because it upregulates your liver. So I tell people, so eat burdock every day. And you know how many people over the last 20 years have eaten burdock root every day? None. Zero, including me, even though I, I'm into it. Although I don't like to grow it because it's invasive and it's a pain in the ass. Uh, but so now we take burdock, uh, we steam it, and then as soon as it's ready to eat, we fix it essentially at that stage by drying it. And then we grind it and put it into these mirin jars, which maintain the freshness. And so I can now eat burdock, like a whole burdock root every day, where, and I never used to do that because it just, it's just a pain. So that's why we did this. So, personally, one of the, mo the the reason why I was so interested in doing this interview is that I, me, me, my entire family are avid gardeners. In fact, you know, I, I have my own garden and I and I plant one for my grandmother. My father has two gardens. My brother has a garden. We dehydrate, freeze, ferment, just like you. So I'm a, I'm a foodie, just like you. Um, and this is why your products and your produce intrigue me so much. Now, you don't do you grow all of these plants that you um, that you make the powders into, or do you source them from other places? Yeah, we uh, so some so you know we don't have. First of all, it's not even my actual property. It's a friend of ours is letting us use. It's a little bit under an acre, and so some so we grow a lot, and it's amazing how much in a great place like Napa you can grow. Um, how much you can grow in a year. So like all the tomatoes in our tomato salt are from our garden. And all the, um, well, three of the four components of the perennial greens mixture, the tree collards, the malabar, and the genera, 
almost all of that comes from our garden. And then we have a farmer friend down the road who grows some Malabar for us. Um, whereas with beets, first of all, beets take up a lot of room. They take up a lot of time. And so that would be the whole garden to just do our beet powder. And, and the other thing about beets is they're not that hard to grow, you know, organically and get a good beet. So those we source from, you know, the best place we can. I mean, it, mostly around here, local, um, you know, we're, we're looking into the best way of doing that. We're looking into getting, you know, biodynamically sourced beets. But they're certainly all organic, and they're the best quality, the best varieties that we can find. The pumpkins all came from our garden, which is why we had so little, uh, because um, we lost some. But we use like uh, heirloom, you know, Native American pumpkins and, you know, New Zealand pumpkins that are basically the most nutritious and the most flavorful. So... You know, I garden for for flavor and for um, nutrition. And I tend to think if I want to say, oh, OK, I want to grow a pumpkin, which pumpkin should I grow? I go to the people who know the most about pumpkins, which I think are the Native Americans. And so I, I grow their pumpkins. Now, to some people, that may not sound very scientific. But I tell you, once you figure out who know, like, the Russians knew the most about kale, so we use Russian kale, scarlet kale, which is a Russian variety. So that so that's how I do it. So we either we don't grow a hundred percent of everything in our line. Uh, we're we're now just way too big for that. But everything is 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 the best source we can get it, and you know that's what we're continue to do, and we're going to continue to push for even better more biodynamic stuff, even, you know, contracting with farms. Because one of our missions was, you know, we, we want wherever we're processing, whether it's, you know, Northern California or whatever, I mean, we would like the whole farming community to be uh, get uh, help from us in being economically vi viable because they're growing the best biodynamic stuff for us we're paying them to do it, and they're having a good old time making a great biodynamic farm. Right. I mean, that's the world that I envision. Uh, whether that's going to happen or not, who knows? But that's the world that I envision, and our my wife and two sons. That's that's a that's a, that's a vision I could stand behind for sure. Now, yeah, I mean, just just imagine if every if all the farmers were you know biodynamics or or permaculture, organics, whatever, you know. I don't want to quibble on whether, you know, if you're a great organic farmer, I mean, that's fine, you know. <laughs> I know. I, I totally I, I totally agree. Now, you have some really unique products. A few I've never heard of. Most I've heard of before, and some I grow, but uh, I'd like you to give a little insight on some of the, the little bit more obscure products you have like chala shaga ashitaba Th these things are not no normal vernacular or or common plants w why are they different or special or what do they have to offer you you touched on why burdock is so good but how about some of the more unique uh, unique products that you guys have so yeah that's a great question and you go back to the mission which is wild and perennial foods because you know, it's true. People don't need to get carrot powder from us to eat carrots. People eat carrots. Now, it's also true that, you know, you may not always have a carrot. And if you have some carrot powder, you can put it in your soup and it may make your soup better. So but but the real mission is, OK, no, people are not eating wild foods. They're not eating perennial foods. Where can we source them and have them in an easy to use form? So then you take something like choya buds, which is spelled C-H-O-A, C-H-O-A-L-L-A. -A. So this was one of the sort of special, you might call it superfoods of the Native Americans in the Sonoran uh, Southwest Desert. And it's, it's essentially got two main uses. One is it's a very rich source of calcium. 
and the other it has a kind of an anti-diabetic drug similar to the drug metformin. And it's the bud of a cactus, which you can, you know, wild harvest and then dry it, and then it'll store forever, you know, years. And, and then you, you, you can, we bought them from a, a guy who contacted us who heard me on a podcast and said, oh, that's what I do. I'm a forager. So, so first of all, the first good thing is this guy who's, we can help him make a living because he doesn't have a market, really. He doesn't know how to sell things, but he knows how to collect things. And he's been collecting them from an, you know, an unspoiled area that he's been working for decades. So he collects the choya buds. They're dried. So we put them in a pack. And all you need to do is you, you know, you have to think ahead, but you rehydrate them for about a day. And then they, they, they get this sort of mushy, mushroomy thing. And you can saute it in stir fries or put it in soup. And I wouldn't say it's the best tasting food in the world because some of the things are purely or mostly for taste. And other things like choya buds are for, you know, nutritional diversity and the medicinal value. And they taste a little bit like mushrooms or asparagus or something. So some people may like that. So we always have a few. We soak them. We add them to the soup. It's great for diversity. So that's that one. Chaga is a mushroom that, I, um, that grows only on birch trees in northern forests. I first heard about this because I, when I was a teenager, believe it or not, I used to read a, a lot of, of dark Russian novels, which my sister used to tease me about. But anyways, I did. And I read a book by Solzhenitsyn called Cancer Ward, where this guy, which may have been an autobiographical book, cured himself by drinking this fungus from a, from a birch tree, which was shaga mushrooms. And so I've been interested in shaga uh, as a medicinal mushroom for cancer and other metabolic things for 30 years. So we found a company in Quebec, which, as far as I know, my, my son checked it out more than I did. But they go into the, you know, sort of virgin forest in northern Quebec with horseback and sustainably harvest this chaga, put it into nuggets and send it to us, not not just us, but other places probably. And so you make it into a tea, and all I can say is over the years, the people who have serious health problems who drink shaga tea do better than the people who don't drink shaga tea. And so I sometimes drink shaga tea. Um, so that's that one. Ashitaba is a, is a native biennial, uh, which means it grows for two years, native to uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Japan. It's it, probably the most nutritious vegetable on the planet, or one of them. It's the only edible uh, angelica family herb or plant. It has a kind of celery taste, uh, and it has a very potent uh, an antioxidant in the in the stem called chalcones or calcones, which is being intensively studied as a anti-cancer medicine. So not only does it have more nutrients by about double as kale, um, but it, it has very strong medicinal properties. Uh, we were also told that by a Japanese guy at a fair, you'll never grow this in California, which of course. You know, gardening, of course, is a competitive sport, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and so that got my juices flowing. And I will admit, it's tricky to grow. <laughs> so he was, you have to shade it and then uncover it. And it's, it's, it's definitely finicky. But we and a, a biodynamic friend of ours have grown enough to get, you know, 500 or so jars. And we're working on sourcing more of that. So those are the three you mentioned. I'm happy to go through any other one. but Well, let me switch the question a little tiny bit now. So what are some of your favorites? So I, I put burdock root in my soup every day. I also 
uh, one w that we don't sell, which is I, I grow summer savory, which is a, sort of helps reverse the aging process, I think. So I use that, but we don't sell that. Next year we will. Good. I use ashitaba powder every day, uh, but some of them I use almost entirely for flavor, like like eggs with um, with our pepper salt. And so these are about six different varieties of peppers, some bell peppers, some sweet peppers, some hot peppers. And we mix that with a little bit of Celtic salt and you sprinkle that, out, that on eggs. And it's just, it, it's just so much better tasting than anything else I've ever eaten on eggs. Um, we put charred eggplant, if you make popcorn and you put butter and then you put charred eggplant, which we take, those are all our eggplants, I think. And uh, we char them on an open fire and then dehydrate them and mix it with a little leek powder and pepper salt. It's amazing flavor on fish or eggs or popcorn or rice or whatever. So those are my favorites. I also like the, the taste of leeks. So even though I eat a lot of leeks, I put leek powder in everything, just about. Leeks also, interestingly, have been shown to be the number one food that uh, that enhances the diversity of a person's microbiome. This came out of the Human Microbiome Project. So that's a great addition to people with digestive troubles and things like that, IBS, Crohn's, colitis. Um, What's the reason for leeks being the number one food? Is there, because I heard you in that another interview, and that really was astounding to me. What's the reason there? I don't know. <laughs> That's I, not here's a my, 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 I mean, I, you know, it's one of those, it is what it is. That's what they found. Cool. Um, but if I had to make a guess, it's, it's, Number one, leeks have like all of the the allium family: onions, garlic, leeks, ramps, etc. They all have antimicrobial effect, so they kill off pathogens. That's number one. Number two is they have um, chemicals in them which are called prebiotics, which are nutrients that the good bacteria need in order to live. Because after all. What grows in your gut, which is sort of everything health-wise, is dependent on what you feed it. And if you only feed it six foods your entire life, you're going to get a predominance of a very few microorganisms. Whereas if you feed it, you know, 300 different plants in your life, you'll 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 encourage much more diverse organisms that find their food. Because what grows is what you feed it. And apparently, leeks have chemicals, which are called prebiotics, which feed the most diverse uh, organisms that we found in the gut. Now, I'm not saying there's, you know, that onions aren't good or ramps aren't good or, you know, all that. The more you can eat, the better. And I'm not even talking about huge bowls of leeks, like Half of a leak is enough. Uh, the green part is a little better than the white part, but you know, you know what I mean. It's not like you need to eat a a bushel of kale, like two or three leaves. That that's enough, and then you eat something else. Right, 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 right. That's very wise advice. It tastes better. I mean, you know, nobody really wants to eat a big salad bowl of kale, but if you put, you know, seven or eight different vegetables, it's you know, with then powders that increase the flavor i mean you're talking about really tasty food then yeah, I, th I think that that's 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 the key i i agree with you flavor is so 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 important now yeah. other products that that we love and support like breakaway matcha and alatura use the same myron glass jars you do why are they so important yeah, and, and nobody quite knows how to pronounce it, but I think it's it's actually French Miron. Or uh, I'm not going to try that, but I'll take. Yeah, I say Miron jars. Um, so the story was, you know, the urban myth, if you wanted to say, was that they were found in the pyramids. They had some oil in it. Somebody opened it up, tasted the oil, and it was fine. So that's 
4,000 or whatever years. And so then some Swiss guys got a hold of it and reverse engineered it and found that the color and the thickness screened out pretty much all but the UVA light and that if you put stuff in there, biological stuff, it doesn't degrade. It actually enhances the energy of the product which of course needs to be verified, but there are some interesting studies on it. And so before I was gonna put powders in a jar and let them just degrade, I wanted to see if this was real. So before we even launched this company, I grew a cherry tomato plant and picked two, you know, you could say identical cherry tomatoes. Of course, they're not 100% identical, but close enough and put one in a mason jar and one in a mirin jar and put them on the counter. The one in the mason jar, you know, was mushy and moldy and all that. In about four to five weeks, which was actually longer than I thought, but the one in the mirin jar was uh, essentially edible after at least four months, maybe five months. And we have a picture of that on our website. And that did more to convince me that... <laughs> There's something real in this these than than the urban myth about the Egyptians. Um, so that's why we decided we could do this. We could preserve it and put our powders in these mirin jars as soon after we process them as possible. And I have now like I have a mint powder that I made it's probably two and a half years ago. And if you open it up, it smells like fresh mint. And, you know, I go by taste and smell a little bit, the chemistry, but I don't care that much about that. So when I hear people saying, oh, they have Ashitaba powder, too. It comes from, you know, Japan and they have freeze dried or do this fancy, you know, spraying technique, which is fine. But I open the jar and there's no smell and there's no taste. And I don't know about you, but I don't eat food that doesn't smell or doesn't taste. <laughs> no, I would be. I, I agree. So I don't like that stuff. And maybe they can test it and it has more magnesium than ours. I kind of doubt it. But the difference is I know what Ashitaba is supposed to smell like because just yesterday, you know, I, I weeded it <laughs> for a half an hour and my wife and I struggled to put these covers on it and they were ripped and, you know, it was raining and all that stuff. Uh, but you end up knowing what this plant is like because, you know, she spent a half an hour cutting the stalks and you get this yellow stuff oozing all over. And that's the, that's the active ingredient. So, you know, if somebody says, well, how do you know there's, there's yellow stuff in your powder? It's because, well, some of it's on Linda's hands, <laughs> and the rest of it got into the to the um, the bucket which we brought to the kitchen, which they put in the de in the dryer that night or t today. So that's how I know. <laughs> Good answer. I'll take it. <laughs> just uh, just a few questions left uh, uh, today. Uh, and it's a question. One of the questions I finish all my interviews with um, day in the life of Dr. Cowan from sleep, uh, from waking to sleeping. What do I do? Yes, exactly. When you from waking, uh, like kind of the rhythm of every day. Well, like I said, we usually stop eating at 536. Uh, I, I go to bed early and then we have uh, my wife and I have our usual exchange of how come you're going to bed so early <laughs> and she wants to stay up a little later, but I, I read in bed, go to sleep, wake up, usually do some sort of exercise. Today I ran up some stairs and walked up a hill, uh, do some other things, you know, answer emails, make my breakfast, which is usually the soup and the eggs, sometimes uh, the sourdough bread that I make. Uh, either garden or go to work. Uh, I don't work that much, but I garden more. Uh, 
have dinner, you know, which is meat, fish, chicken, soup, vegetables, sometimes some grains, some fruit, you know, usual stuff. And that's about it. Read, talk, whatever. Sounds it sounds like something I would like to do every day as well. Do you do you have any final words or any thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with? Uh, only check out our powders. I, I can guarantee you like them. Everybody does. Um, well, almost everybody, but ninety seven percent. And if you know anybody who knows how to grow ashitaba, uh, give us a call. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or if you have any wild foods that you that we haven't thought about, uh, give us a call. That's a great. I hope. Uh, yes, I just I just Not saw much, a, a ton of Jerusalem artichokes from my garden. Yeah. That, no, that, wait, got... not mushrooms. Mushrooms put you into a whole different regulatory category, which besides shaga, that's sort of not really a mushroom. Right. But we don't want to get into mushrooms. You're talking, you're talking about re, reishi and things of that nature, right? Yeah. Retail. I mean, those are great wild dried foods, but the regulatory hurdles around mushrooms are, you know, that's not for us. I, I hear you. I hear you. Well, please remember, all the links will be in the show notes. It's www.drcowensgarden.com and use BYWG to receive 20% off your first purchase. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cowan. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and family and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. You can also sign up for our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. Thank you, and as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome.